I've never even begun to think that that would be her nickname, but it's a pretty good one. <laughs> I have? Oh, okay, I'm on. Hello, everybody. Glad you're here. Uh, we're glad to get back into the groove after the holidays and Easter and all that stuff. It, it was a great weekend. The Lord blessed. We want to open in prayer today and ask the Lord to guide us and prepare our mind to receive the word. I, I do my best to make Wednesday nights more of a study so that we can learn some things we might not learn anywhere else and uh, also do it in a way that our spirits are fed. So uh, we're going to open in prayer and ask the Lord to be with us and then we'll hear a testimony and um, Brian is going to try to get the volume up on the Facebook because Guy is working and he wanted to hear it. He couldn't hear it last week. So Guy, if you can hear me now, don't work too hard, bud. <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the day and we thank you for the opportunity to serve you and to walk in uh, your house and walk among your people and to do the work of the ministry, Lord. We know we are blessed and highly favored. We ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and minds. Let the word Take root and begin to grow in us so that there will be a harvest. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Somebody give us a word of testimony. <coughs> well, I know he's not here, but I'm going to testify for him. The bone conduction device off of Baja is working really well. Good. Just adjusting to it really well. Having fun making all those little special settings. Can he just turn it off? Well, <laughs> there was. He can pull the battery out of it, but it does have this thing called an impulse noise reduction that will, if the noise is too loud, it will automatically shut it off. So when we were at church on Good Friday and they were singing and I stood up next to him and started singing, it shut off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, praise the Lord for Oz. Yes, I do. Anybody else? I'm getting a single bin that's in a piece of furniture today, and neither one of them got hurt, but there were so many moans and groans and cries. <laughs> Very good job. Person. I'm just thankful they both survived. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow may be a new story. I, I don't think you want Billy Ray and I both uh, on you. <laughs> If I'd have known that, I'd have fired her right on the spot. <laughs> yes, Kristen. Well, you know, um, you know, Lord knows I, I have a lot of um, stuff that happens in my head, and I'm really grateful that the Lord has healed me. This past spring break for me was kind of rough, um, but I came out of it, you know, and um, I feel like even stronger than I had before with my faith in the Lord, and, uh, you know, I'm just really grateful for that. Good. Yes. Brittany wanted to be the one to testify this because you mentioned it Sunday morning. She just sent me a text. She's on her way and said, "Please tell them about my brother." Most of you know she's got a 17 year old brother who lives in North Carolina, and he was driving home Saturday morning, and the truck his friend was driving in front of him stopped. Long story short, the truck in front of him rolled, and Hester's truck demolished. I mean, the engine was. I don't know how he walked away. But I pray every day for that child. Lord, please make people cross his path that will witness to him. You know, God, keep your covering on him. I'm not there geographically. Please make sure there's someone by him all the time. After this happened, the car that the kid in front of him was trying to avoid, the gentleman jumps out of his car, grabs both boys, and starts praying with them. Praise the Lord. And Amen. Amen. Yes. What did she say? You got a two? Okay, Cheryl. Sure.
Well, praise the Lord. Yes. Yes, that's a great that's a great thing. We're in Thanksgiving. That, oh, we got special guests tonight. Corey will have to behave. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to have the Berlins here. <laughs> no, we just said Corey was going to have to behave because his daddy was here and his sister. So. All right, guys. Anybody else? All right. We are looking at Nathaniel, who is the Next disciple on the list, he and Philip were close. Uh, when you begin to look in the word at these men, and I've been pastoring and preaching over 40 years, a long time. You would think I would get better at it by this time, but I've been doing that a long time, and I had never really focused on the disciples and how many times they were mentioned in the word and who was doing what and what that would mean to us as we study the word and begin to understand who they were. Nathaniel was also called Bartholomew. Bartholomew was the Hebrew name for him, and that name meant God-given. Apparently his mother was excited that he was born, and she gave him a name that was God-given. My mother didn't give me a name like that. Uh, I, I, I probably was too much of a rounder for, for that. But he, he had a name that was Bartholomew, and it meant God-given. He was the son of Talmai, and he is only mentioned in the Scripture on two occasions that I can find. One is in John 1, where he was called of Jesus. You know, the Lord went to Nathanael and called him. When he looked at him, he made a statement, and he said, Nathaniel is a man in whom there is no guile. Now, if you look at the word uh, dissection there, you'll find out that he literally was a man of character, and that was what the Lord was saying when he saw him. And uh, he was also named in the passage of Scripture where when Peter and the other disciples went back to Galilee to go back to fishing after the resurrection, but before the ascension, he was mentioned there. So uh, that is, is important. Nathaniel was a student of Old Testament prophecy. Now, if you look at the patterns or the life uh, examples in Philip and Nathaniel, Apparently, they studied together. This was a normal place. Uh, at that time in Israel, Nathanael was from Cana. Now, uh, when Philip came to him, you may not remember, but when Philip told him they had found the Messiah that was spoken of by Moses, and he said he was from Nazareth, Nathanael's words were, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's kind of like, being from West Terre Haute or something, you know. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yes, Candy? So this is actually part of the subject in Tuesday morning's Bible study. Uh huh. And Corey had a very good insight that I hadn't heard before. I don't know if anybody else had there or not. But the town of Nazareth itself, all of them were wholly involved in building a city for Rome, and that was their whole occupation. And so many consider that that's probably why people thought nothing good came out of Nazareth. Okay, I, th I think that's probably a good observation, and it lines up with what I read in the book, Twelve Ordinary Men. Um, of course, when Nathaniel said that, if you look at Cana, where he was from, it was no extraordinary place to come from either. And so we, we find out very quickly that even though Jesus identified Nathaniel as a man in whom there was no guile, we find out he had some weaknesses spiritually too because he had some prejudice. And we're going to talk about those things a little bit tonight. I want to read uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4, if the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. 
They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Now, Paul was writing in this uh, letter to, to the Corinthians, and he was talking about those things that were hidden from believers. We, we have heard the terminology in the King James. They have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, but they don't hear. Nathaniel was someone who was believing that God uh, was going to send a Messiah. He had been studying. He was consistent in his study, and he was faithful. And when Philip came to him and he grabbed him, he said, Come on, we need to go see the man that is the Messiah from Nazareth. And, of course, you, you know what he said. And Nathaniel said, Okay. And they head over to see the Lord, and when they get there, the Lord looks at Nathaniel and said, Hey, here's an Israelite indeed. And he used a Greek term there, atheos, which meant he was really an Israelite because the Lord had talked ad nauseum at times about the hypocrisy in Israel as a nation. What do you think his idea of hypocrisy in Israel as a nation was? Where was, where was the Lord coming from with that? In Israel as a nation? Yes. Because they were serving tradition and man and leaders who were not really their leaders. <laughs> but you know, clean on the outside, not on the inside. Yeah, why did sepulchers twice dead and pluck, plucked up twice, I think the scripture says? When you look at how the Lord talked about the church of the Judaic church of that day, he was focused on the hypocrisies of the day. They were more Israelite in name than they were in spiritual relationship. And I think that's something that if you're going to look at the example of Nathan, one of the things you've got to look at and ask yourself, am I a believer? Am I a believing, walking, talking believer who is willing to die for the cause of Christ? Because the people of Israel at that time, they were more caught up in their power structure and their caste system and, and all of those things. And, and the Lord looked at Nathaniel and out of his mouth, he said, there's an Israelite indeed. And Nathan, Nathaniel, I want to say Nathan, I called you Nathan, but it, it's Anthony. Good to have Anthony back tonight. Uh, at least I got it halfway right. It, uh, when he talked to Nathan, Nathaniel looked at him and said, Do you know me? How do you know me? And the Lord looked at him and said, Well, when you were under the fig tree with Philip, I saw you. And immediately there was a revelation to Nathaniel that was life-changing. It was that omniscience of Jesus, the fact that he knew where he had been and who he was talking to, indicated to Nathaniel with no question that this truly was the Son of God. We as believers need to come to the place that we recognize the omniscience of the Lord in our lives in everything we do. If we did, if we understood the omniscience of God, we would have less trouble believing that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We would believe that he knows, he understands, and everything that is happening in his plan, he is there, he's involved, and he knows. You see, I want us to understand who God is by understanding who he called to represent him as the disciples of Christ. He called people who believed in the power of God to seek and save that which was lost. He wanted the church that existed in that day to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus and to put off the clothes or the, the robes of ceremonial church and get involved in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important that we understand as believers that what we say, what we do, how we live exemplifies whether we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or not. I heard a story about a guy that fell off the edge of a cliff and he was hanging on to a tree. 
And he began to pray. And he said, somebody help me. Somebody help me. And the Lord said, let go of the limb. And he thought a minute. He said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> you know, we want to believe the Lord as long as it makes sense to us. We want to believe the Lord as long as we understand the makeup of his process and his thinking. What have you learned about the process of the Lord and his way? What do you know about it? Since I've been saved or... <laughs> do what now? Are you talking about what have we recently learned, like in this study, or are you talking about... Since Over your what we go, what have you learned about the ways of God? They're not our ways. Exactly. He... he yeah, he, he doesn't do. I mean, we wanted God to show your grandson, you know, that he was God. And we would think, Lord, just let him in a church get saved and come to the reception of the Lord as, a, as his Savior and all that. But that's not what the Lord did. The Lord showed up and showed out in the midst of chaos where there was no denial of who the Lord was. This is what I found with the Lord is no matter where I am or no matter what I'm doing, the Lord is involved and he knows even when I don't think he cares. That's right. But he does care. He does care. Man, when we, we started doing entries in, in Louisiana and I was responsible for the team and, I, and I, I told them before we went in, we're going to pray every time before we go. And so every time we would pray, and then we'd go kick a door and ruin somebody's day and arrest them, take them to jail. And that went on for a little while, and I didn't think anybody really cared. It was like one of those things, it's what, you know, Padre's doing, it's just his thing. And then one day I was later getting there, everybody else had gotten there, they were ready to go. And I ran up and got my stuff on and got ready to go in, and one of them said, wait a minute, you ain't prayed yet. And all of a sudden I realized that God had been working all things to my good and I needed to trust him and that was a good thing when you least think the Lord is working in your favor he is and Nathaniel understood the omniscience of God God knows you he knows your circumstances and he knows better than you what the plan should be nobody jumped up and said amen We need to stop asking the Lord to do what, bless what we're doing and, and ask him to let us do what he's blessing. Exactly. That's important. That's important. There were some prejudices, prejudices that had been established in that culture, just like there are prejudices in this culture. When I tell people I'm from Arkansas, uh, I hear every kind of, of teasing that you can imagine. Uh, they ask me, can I count with my shoes on? Uh, they ask me if I didn't know that the toothbrush was designed in Arkansas because if it had been anywhere else, it would have been a teeth brush. You know, I've heard all those, you know, can you read and write? Do you speak English? You know, those kinds of things. Because where I'm from is a redneck culture in a southern state. And all of those things may or may not be true. I'll let you decide that. But as Nathan, Nathaniel looked at the Lord, his prejudice was to someone coming from the city of Nazareth. And why that prejudice was there, nobody knows. But it was a prejudice. And it was very prominent among the Jewish leadership. Do you remember when they asked the disciples, Don't, you guys are ignorant, unlearned men? You come from fishing industry. You come from other areas. There were prejudices to them that, that they were not well accepted or well liked in the church. Rich? Didn't Abraham walk all through there? Oh, yeah. Just asked from Galilee to Nazareth to Canaan. Yep. Hey, every time I've met somebody of note, one of the biggest battles they fight is to, to not forget where they come from. You know, when, when you rise to power, you rise to authority, 
The Bible said pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I, I've known, I, I could call names, and you've heard me talk about them before. Men who are on television have been preaching many, many years. I have been close to them. I have been in their company and all of those things, and I'm not saying that to name drop, but in an almost every case, if they aren't careful, they will find themselves in a problem because they forgot where they came from. They began to seek success more than they sought to please God. And let me tell you, when the Lord shuts that down, when you have to deal with your failure, it's tough on a personal level. But if you can come back from it, if the Holy Spirit can guide you through the traps of being so self-absorbed, then you can do something for the kingdom of God. And, and I think that's exactly why those prejudices, both from Nathaniel and people in the Judaic church at that time, were so important. They, they couldn't believe that Jesus of Nazareth could be the Messiah. He didn't come the way they expected him to come. He didn't live and do what they expected him to do. And so when you, when you begin to talk about that and you, you begin to, to look at those issues, it was hard for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Hellenists and all of those people to look at Jesus, a carpenter's son from Nazareth, in their mind a carpenter's son. He was Joseph's son. How in the world could he be the Messiah? And yet when Nathaniel got to him and asked, how do you know me? You said, I'm a Jew indeed. I'm an Israelite indeed. How do you know me? It was the omniscience of God that moved in Nathaniel and he immediately said, okay, I'm going to follow you. Take a minute and look back in your own life at the time when you decided to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Can somebody just give me a brief overview about when you decided, I'm going to follow the Lord, and what that was like. Huh? Well, Candy was a preacher's kid. I was a preacher's kid. We lived in the church for many, many years. And we had experience outside, yet there was a time when, just like the prodigal, you come to a point where you say, you know what, I'm out here, I'm hungry, I'm living in misery, and even the servants in my father's house have the things that they need. Mm -hmm. Very humbling. It, it is a humbling experience. And to know that you have, not you, but that I had failed him so miserably, and then come back asking for his grace, you know, the prodigal didn't go back and say, I, I want a ring and a robe. I want to go back as the son. I've already spent my half of the inheritance, but that doesn't matter. I want to go back as the son. That isn't what he did. He said, man, I messed up. I've spent my half. I'm going back to serve in my father's house as a servant. Let me tell you, when we come to serve the Lord as servants of the Most High God, we have far more success and God can work. Anybody here got a, a thought on when you decided to follow the Lord? That moment when you knew? Yes. So it was my sophomore year in high school, and I had recently joined the Jesus groups. My friend introduced me to it. I didn't grow up religious at all, Christian or Mormon. That wasn't really pushed on me. And, and that's, that's an awesome testimony. 
It didn't matter that you weren't in here. You were in a car, you prayed the prayer of faith, and the Lord saved you. And then the most important thing he said, my life did a 180 degree flip. God changed my life. I like that he said, I don't know why I felt there was a need, but even as a youngster, as a teen, I believe there was a need to cry out to God. I believe that to be the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe the Lord, in that prevenient grace, begins to court us long before we choose to be obedient to Him. And I think it is, it is utterly important and truth that we come to know that, yes, there was a point where I decided I was going to serve the Lord, and at that moment, my life was changed forever. And I, I think that's exactly what happened with Nathaniel. He had been curious. He had been studying. As young men, they had been studying about the prophet and, and what the prophecy, Old Testament prophecies had to say about Jesus. But when he met him and the omniscience of God was revealed to him, at that moment, he was in. 180 degrees, I'm going a different direction. Now, like most of us, at that point in time, he began to realize that Jesus was hated by the church, the Judaic church. He began to realize that there was persecution and there were problems and there were circumstances that he may not know how to deal with, but he decided to follow Jesus anyway. And once Jesus was crucified and placed in the tomb and was resurrected, he went back to fishing. You say, well, why is that important? Because let me tell you, sometimes you don't know what to do, and most of us go back to what we know how to do until the Lord gives us direction further. So is that, is that just what you said, wait until we get the direction, or is that us going back to fishing? Well, my dad told me a long time ago, especially right in the beginning of my ministry. He said, don't kick any doors open and only go through the open doors. And he said, if you don't know what to do, be still. I thought that was pretty pretty good advice, especially at, at now 68, looking back. My dad was a wise man. He taught me things that I could not have known. Nathaniel knew that Jesus was the Christ. He knew it immediately because the omniscience of God was revealed to him. And in that process, he made a decision to follow the Lord. Uh, those guys weren't sure how the church was going forward. When I say the church, I'm not talking about the Judaic church. I'm talking about the people of the way. They did not know how the church was going to progress because Jesus, the leader of the way, was gone. So what do we do? Let's go catch some fish. Let's make a little money, figure out what we're going to do. And he had resurrected. They knew he was alive. They, he was seen by over 500 people. It was testimony of his resurrection, but he had not yet ascended. And then he showed up and said, this is what I want you to do. This is how you're to proceed. He said, I want you to go to Jerusalem and tarry until you can be endued by the Holy Spirit. There is a gift that is coming. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. And I want you to come expecting because it's going to be an exciting time in the Lord. I believe that Nathaniel, at that point in his life, knew that God was going to work something in him. Quit pinching her. Well, anywhere else it would hurt her. Yes. I'd like to just share a blessing that I had today. I went to uh, Terre Haute to uh, to my oncologist, and uh, she had a difference of opinion. I shut that door. I went to Indianapolis, and I seen uh, another doctor who was treating me before, and uh, she came up with a treatment. Brand new. 
deal. Uh, Nathaniel was in a place where he knew that he was part of leadership. These were the 12. He had called 12, and he was one of those 12. And it was important he understood his role as a leader. And when God pointed out through the experience that he had, the fact that there were some prejudices that he needed to deal with, he did so. And when God pointed out what he was looking for in him as a leader and made him recognize the fact that there, were his, there was hypocrisy in the church, we tend to do things in our worship that we've learned. Does that make sense? I grew up in a Pentecostal church, and yeah, there was there was traditional worship, and that was we were shouters and tongue talkers and hand clappers and dancers, and we ran and, and believed in the power of the Holy Spirit to work, and still do. Much of what we do at Family Worship Center is fashioned uh, after the way that we worshipped when I was a, a boy growing up, and I've got, I make no apologies about that. Now, is it as conservative as it was when my dad was there? Absolutely no, because our society is nowhere near that conservative. Should we do some things to make it more conservative? Absolutely. We need to, we need to draw closer to the Lord and let him take us out of some of these areas that maybe uh, we're struggling with. But the Lord wanted Nathaniel to know that he expected him to be a representative of that had no hypocritical influence. He was not moved by what he saw or what he heard from other people. He was moved by what he knew in his relationship to the Lord. How many of you know how to pray? You know how to pray? What happens when you pray? Things change. Things change. Elaborate. Elaborate. Yeah. You're talking to the redeemer of your soul, the one that restored you unto the Father. So the conversation in and of itself is awesome because of who you get to talk to and who chooses to listen and respond to you. Um, you speak, he hears, he listens, he speaks. Hopefully we hear, we listen. And I don't mean an audible voice. But not just, there are many times the circumstances around you do not change, but within you, you will be changed. You will be strengthened when you are weak. You will be healed when you are sick, so on and so on. And there is a shift, or there should be a shift in the atmosphere and in your mental perspective and in your joy level and in your peace level and on and on and on. That's what happens when you pray. And everything in the spiritual affects the physical, and everything in the physical affects the spiritual. Well, and, and I think it's important to make note. You said he speaks and you listen. Uh, Dad said we got two ears and one mouth. We ought to talk and listen in, in that percentage. We ought to listen twice as much as we talk. And, and we've, we've used James 1.17 many times, being slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to anger. But even in our prayer life... Uh, be still and know. We tend to want to do as the pagans do, and that is to recite over and over and over and over and over again. Recite these prayers over and over and over again. I believe when you pray, you release it unto the Father, and then you listen to see what he's going to say to you. Amen? Amen. He will speak to you. He'll speak to you through this word. He'll speak to you through his Holy Spirit. Sometimes he'll speak to someone, and they will give you a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, or uh, there will be a message in tongues and interpretation. He will speak to you if you are tuned in and want to hear. Candy? Can I go back for just a minute and touch on what you were talking about with Nathaniel? Yes. And how you know he had been a student, much as Paul. He had been a student. He knew the law. He knew the prophecies. And then he met Jesus. And so there was a new level, would you say, you know, 180 degree turn, however you, don't you believe, or I shouldn't say, don't, I believe, I can ask you if you agree with me, we'll put it that way, I think it's that way for a lot of Christians, you, you get saved and you're just kind of in this, I'm saved, 
and then you really have an encounter, something happens that makes you pay attention. Uh, for me, I had rededicated my life, and then my first husband killed himself, and my pastor at that time laid hands on me and prayed over me. And it was a blinding light on the way to Damascus, whatever you want to call it. It was There was a shift, and I think that happens with a lot of Christians. It's not just a matter of salvation, but then as you progress, it is a matter of complete surrender and following after the Lord's will. The, the longer you walk with him and listen with him and talk with him, the more you surrender, the more you become like him, the more. I do agree with you. I believe the relationship matures and grows as you walk with the Lord. I, th I don't think you can have a relationship with the Lord if it doesn't. and it not grow that way because he knows you. He knows his plans for you. You know, I, I hate to go back to the things I've experienced, but I can't give your testimonies. I don't know what your testimonies are. And I've shared my testimony with you on a number of occasions, but I remember laying in the bed with my wife on that Thursday night when the Holy Spirit came into the room. Now, I had been a pastor for 20 years and, and was backslid. I, I had literally walked in darkness for a number of years. And yet, the moment the Holy Spirit came in, others, not many, but others had tried to come and encourage me to get back in church and to do what I knew I should have done when I didn't do it. Anybody else been there? Am I the only one? I'm the only one. But on that Thursday night, I hadn't prayed or wept in over five years. And boy, when the Holy Spirit came in that room, I knew it was the Lord. I knew it was God. And immediately, because I had a background, I began to do the things I knew to do as a pastor, even though I had been out for five years, I began to praise Him. I began to glorify Him. I began to lift up the name of Jesus. I began to do the things... I remembered from the scripture, and I, I didn't do it because I felt like I had to. I did it because in the presence of the Lord, it was easy to glorify him. It was easy to, to glorify him. And I remember it was 11.05 when I looked at the clock, and I, I began to weep. And at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, the, the Holy Spirit just allowed me to rest for the first time in four or five years and there was no doubt in my mind that God had made a change in my life. But the next morning, I wasn't sure what I needed to do. I made a decision. I'd been a pastor for 20 years, but for the life of me, I didn't know what I needed to do. And so for the next two or three years, the Lord directed my path and guided me, sometimes not because I was obedient, but because he's smarter than I am. And I found myself in a place where he was giving me direction. And then I had to be willing to be obedient. Once you turn around and you begin to make that 180 degree turn, that's when you're going to encounter problems. That's when the enemy wants to destroy you. I had somebody the other day to say to me, why is the enemy after me so badly? I said, because if you give your heart to the Lord and begin to do what he's called you to do, you're going to be effective and the devil's scared to death of you. He don't want you to do what he's called, God's called you to do. Obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't know what's around the corner. I didn't know. Somebody, I tell this and people laugh at me. I wasn't sure that I could ever go back into the ministry. I knew the Bible said that the callings and giftings of God were unrepentant. I understood that. But I wasn't sure in this area, having lived here and done all the things that had been done, anybody would want to come. And I had a, about seven people come and say, hey, you need, to, you need to start a church. I said, there are 700 churches in the Wabash Valley. Why would I need to start a church? Why, why would I need to do something different than that? And, and I didn't know, and I wrestled with it. And so finally I said, okay, 
This seems to be where the prevailing winds are blowing. I'm trying to be obedient to God. And so I booked a hotel room. But this is where it gets kind of funny. The seven people who encouraged me to start a church were not there that first Sunday. <laughs> it was seven different people. And, and I thought, man, I can't, I can't make decisions from now on based on what people think I should do. <laughs> no, it was, it was back further than that. It was in October. <laughs> Do what? It's that perfect number, seven. Yeah, well, of course, at that point, I was still unsure why the Lord would do that. And there have been days that I'm still unsure why he would. I, I tease about being living proof that he can speak through a donkey. I'm living proof that he can speak through anyone he chooses to speak through. But we're trying to be obedient. We're trying to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. We're fi trying to follow the example set by Nathaniel. Now in Romans, Paul wrote, he said, He is not a Jew is who one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision of that heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, that's in King James Version, so maybe you're not sure what it said, but he's basically saying, I'm not looking for someone who proclaims to be something on the outside. I'm looking for someone whose heart has been changed, whose ideas have been changed, whose language has changed, whose vision has changed. You know, having a vision is important. The Bible says without a vision, people perish. Nathaniel got his vision changed when he came to the Lord. He'd been a fisherman. Him, Philip, been fishing. We're going to go out and sit on the fig tree and study. I, I, I did some research on that, and the significance of the fig tree was that in that area of the country, most of the homes were one room, and that there was a fire burning all the time, even in the summertime, and that most of the men of the, the houses would go out under a fig tree with the was about 12 or 14 feet high and they would sit there and that was a place they would congregate and they would talk about the scriptures or they would talk about the weather or that old song says, as long as old women are talking about old men, you know. They were sitting out there doing the things <laughs> that they did. And uh, the fact that the Lord saw him under that fig tree and saw him talking to Philip was I believe in genius on the Lord's part because there's no way anybody could fake that. You know, now that light went off. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to follow Jesus. Now, where's that going to lead me? He didn't know in the beginning that it was going to lead him to a martyr's death. You know, if you, if you are honest with people that you recruit to be uh, children of the king, you have to share with them the truth that if you're following Jesus, there's going to be some persecution. There's going to be some people that do not like you. I mean, I, I can go all the way back to 1966, 67. I was walking from my home to the school. My dad was the Pentecostal preacher in town. The Assembly of God Church there was the first Pentecostal church in that town. And some teenagers drove by and threw tomatoes at me and said, you tongue talkers, go home. I was young. I was a kid. I was six, seven years old. I knew what they were talking about because I was in church every time the doors were open. I had been my whole life. I had seen Pentecostal worship, but I didn't know people wouldn't, they would think that we were cultic in that process. I didn't understand any of that. But that's what we went through. And when we, when we grew out of the old building, the old wooden building that was a ramshackle shack, and God put us in a block building with an indoor baptistry, man, that was a big thing to have an indoor baptistry. Thank God for an indoor baptistry, man. Some of y'all got baptized out there in a horse trough when it was how, how cold, Billy? It was spitting snow.
See, now, we're, this is the culture issue we're talking about. She's from down there around Jasonville. Those, those, what good can come from Jasonville? <laughs> Shackamack, yeah. Uh, she said she was, she was baptized in a creek. Now, we know that word is C-R-E-E-K. Oh, well, about the same difference. <laughs> about the same difference. But God came in and did something. And even though there's been ups and downs, good things and bad things, living through loss. Yes. Anybody here lived through some loss? Yes. A lot of people here lived through some loss. Yes. Think about what that means. Almost everybody in this room has lived through loss. I could point it out. I, I remember talking to Billy Ray. He lost a child. How old was she when she passed, Billy? 22 years old. How do you lose a 22-year-old child? Corey's family's lost a sister. Tragic. You loved her. It's loss. Danny's lost his wife. Jill's lost her husband. Mike lost a son. We, we, Jill lost her. I've got two Jills. One and two, just because of when you came. She's the best, I'm the second best. Oh. <laughs> They've had loss. Candy said earlier she had a hu husband that killed himself. That's loss. You cannot imagine what that is. Tammy just lost Steve. You cannot imagine what that is until you have lost something. But I tell you what you can know, every one of them would tell you that in that loss, God showed up and showed out and has ministered to you through the process. You know, if Nathaniel had known, they were either good. We really don't know how Nathaniel died. What are you grinning about up there? Spit it out. Think about it. When God shows up, he shows out. He'll indicate to you that he's God and that he, did, he was never far from you. He was doing what he said he would do. He would never leave you nor forsake you. You know, he, he gives peace. If Nathaniel had known, and we're not sure how he died, but historically one uh, piece of history says he was put in a potato sack and... It was tied and he was thrown into the sea. Another place, it talked about him being crucified in the same manner that the Lord was. Either way, he was a martyr for the things of God. When we sign you up, when we call you to come to Family Worship Center, we don't tell you, come give your heart to the Lord. And then when you walk out the door, the enemy is going to come at you with everything that he's got. We don't tell you that. We tell you that there's good news, that he loves you. And if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, I believe that if we learn from these guys, I, I, what makes a guy like Nathaniel, after the resurrection and after the ascension, choose to follow the Lord even to his death? I think I would die for him. I say that I would die for him, but really, would I? When it comes right down to it, Peter, who was much bolder than I, who lived and worked as a fisherman, who was a tough guy, who tried to kill Malchus in the garden, he still denied him. So my challenge to you and I today as we look at this is not to be believer in name only, not to be believer only in the sense that we profess it, but also in our walk and the experience that we have and be willing to live even to the end. That's all I want you to do tonight is be like Nathan, Nathaniel, a true man of character. John 8, 31 says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. I want to hide the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against God.
Bible says that John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was of God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If the Word can become flesh and dwell among us, then we can live the Word. Jesus exemplified it. Jesus exemplified it by doing it in front of us. Jesus told Nathaniel, if you believe my saying to you that you were under the fig tree with Philip was miraculous, you're going to see even greater things than that. And he spoke to him about ascending and descending into heaven. And, and I always wondered what that was about, but it was a reference into the Old Testament when Jacob had a dream and with Jacob's ladder and the, the angels were coming and going and, and, and Jesus was saying to him, all this stuff you studied in the Old Testament has prepared you for the call that I've placed on your life. We want to be students of the word. We want to be examples of the word. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Um, Mickey Trish called me a little bit a while ago, and he said that his son Jason, um, that Jason was in the hospital, had been there for about four days, and that he had been bleeding internally, and they were trying to figure out what it was, and that once they got in today, they have found some polyps and things but his blood count was down to six. I, I don't know, I'm not a nurse, I don't see any of our nurses here tonight, but that don't sound good to me. So Mickey was weeping and, oh yeah, there's my nurse, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, <laughs> if you need a nurse, she's here. <laughs> uh, we need to pray, and Mickey was very disturbed in his spirit when he called that we, we pray. Uh, we're still playing, praying for little EJ. Uh, she's had a little bout with not knowing what's causing some gastric issues. And uh, so she learned a mean mug this week. I say, she didn't learn it this week. She just perfected it. <laughs> she's a character boy. I want us to be in prayer. Um, for these guys. Mike, I talked to Mike Johnson today. He's hoping that they will let him out by Friday. And uh, they have his feet wrapped in some material that's supposed to keep the infection down. They're going to take it off and examine his feet. He's afraid they're going to want to keep him longer. Uh, but let's pray for Mike and those feet. They got burnt very badly in the tub. Uh, they'd had a problem with the plumbing. I asked how'd that happen, you know, and, and they'd had a problem with the plumbing. Somebody fixed it. They turned the heater up, and they were supposed to turn it down and didn't, and so he got in, and it burned his feet, second, third degree burns. So uh, let's be praying for Mike. He said, I'm going to be there Monday. I'm going to be there Sunday. So I, I, I don't know if he is or he isn't, but let's... Be in pray for our, prayer for our brother. Anybody else that I'm missing? Yeah, she's jaundiced, I don't know. Melody? Pray for her papa. Okay. He's a veteran, but he didn't die. I love that. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the word. Lord, it's by the word that we have the promises that we can believe. It's by the word that we have information that will change our lives. It's by the word and in the word that we grow and our faith begins to be strong. Father, I pray today for every believer in this room that you would strengthen their faith. And like Nathaniel, they could have that 
aha moment when you recognize the omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of the Lord. Lord, we know you're here. We know you're here right now and that you're moving in lives. We know that you're working in situations. And Father, I ask you to work specifically to do everything that we have need of in this situation. Lord, I pray for Jason Treese that you reach into that hospital, that you stop that internal bleeding. You would help them to deal with the polyps that he has. Lord, begin to strengthen him. Mickey was very concerned, and I ask you to touch. Lord, I pray for little EJ. She's here, but she's had some serious problems physically, and they can't explain it. But God, you're God. You don't need our explanation. We just submit her little being to you and ask you to work right now in the name of Jesus, that you would begin to, to do that work in the name of Jesus. Father, you're God, and we glorify you. Lord, I pray for Mike Roberts tonight, Lord, that you continue to heal, work in his body. Let this treatment plan that the oncologist put together from Indy, Lord, let it begin to work and let him have a, a very specific, very good outcome that his quality of life would be built up and that he could continue to grow in the things of God. Lord, I, I pray that you keep us and you guide us and you touch our hearts and our minds. Lord, that you continue to move in ways that we never even imagined that you could. Lord, you, you reach down into those dark spaces that seem to leave unknowns that we don't know how to cope with, and you guide us through those dark passages. Be the God that orders our steps and our feet. Lord, we give you praise. I pray for Miss Beverly, that you help her sleep. Lord, she's been battling bad sleep for years since her husband died. Lord, let her sleep be deep sleep. Let it be effective sleep. Let it be uh, resting sleep, Lord, so that she can begin to do the things she needs to do. Lord, keep your hand on us. Guide us. Show us your way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Man, it's good to have the Berlin family. We love you guys.